Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Thank you. I'm so glad that all of you are here today on this nice sunny but cold day. And we're going to begin in one minute. So I'm just going to invite everyone who's in the back there to come uh, grab a, a seat. And uh, we're so glad that you were able to make it. So in one minute, we'll begin our program. And we're going to begin with our our League of Women Voters, Milwaukee County Board President, who will begin our program this morning. Thank you, Eloisa. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters, welcome to today's program. Uh, the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 as a grassroots nonpartisan organization. The League has been engaging citizens in democracy ever since then, and now we're planning our centennial celebration. Very excited about that. <laughs> our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy, and we do that in different ways. Everybody knows we register voters and promote voting, but we also study issues and advocate for policies that serve the public interest, and we help educate the community through programs like today's. Our next public issues forum is April 6th, and that one is titled Challenging Inequalities, an Update on the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Remember that? <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank our co-sponsors today, Alverno College, UWM Cultures and Communities, Jewish Voice for Peace Milwaukee, the League of United Latin American Citizens, Milwaukee Muslim Women's Coalition, and I want to thank Alverno for hosting this event. This is a really nice space. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge the elected officials in the office. We have, in the uh, audience, we have Alderman Mark Borkowski. Right here. And we have Circuit Court Judge Hannah Dugan, who is a member of the League of Women Voters. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I invite you to learn more about the League on our website. Uh, our membership is open to everyone. We keep the name to honor our founders, but we have men as members and a growing student membership as well. And I also invite you to support us financially. We are an all-volunteer organization except for one part-time office administrator, so we rely heavily on donations. Uh, I'd like to introduce Rachel House, director of the International and Intercultural Center at Alverno, who will get today's program going. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as she said, I'm Rachel House, director of the International Intercultural Center here at Alverno. And I'd really like to welcome all of you here this morning to talk about such an important and timely topic. Um, I want to share just a little story with you. Um, two years ago, I co-presented at a conference um, for students with an Alverno student. Um, and she was a DACA student and she shared her story. Um, our presentation focused on what um, we can do to support um, DACA and undocumented students. And at the end of this session, one of the participants, um, a student, stood up and said, I'm so glad that you were here today. I needed to hear this. My parents brought me here when I was young. We came from China and they had work visas. Their work visas eventually expired, but we never left. I am undocumented, but no one would ever think that. But I need support too. And I think about the student who came to me because she was in a car accident and she got a letter from the person, from the lawyer of the person she hit and she was worried that it would affect her status because she was undocumented. I think too about my father and his brother and his parents who came to the US through forced migration. And I know that had they not gotten visas, they would have made it here any way that they can, they could have. So we're all in this together and we have important work to do. So thank you for being here today. Otra vez, bienvenidos todos. 
Well, good morning, everyone. And I'm going to just do a quick rundown of our program uh, format for today. And we're going to try to keep to our timeline. Um, I am going to say a few words, and I am, will be inviting um, Alverno student Daniela Lopez to join me, and then we'll turn this over to Kathleen Dunn, who will be working on the panel presentation. It will be followed by question and answer, and then afterwards we are going to move into small group discussions, so we're hoping that after the 15-minute break, you'll be able to join us in, we have two rooms designated for small room discussion where I think we get to have a better sense of how people are processing the information we get today. So we hope that you can join us for that segment too from 12.15 to 1 p.m. today. And there will be um, individuals who will direct you to the two uh, small rooms that uh, will be available to us uh, for that 12.15 to 1, 1 o'clock period. Um, we do have a variety of materials for you. We have a bibliography, a resource list of community resources for any of you who uh, need to know how immigrants are supported um, in this process of citizenship. And um, so that is on the table out there. Much of our information that is out there is on our league website. So if we run out of materials, I'm just going to encourage you to go to our league website and identify all the materials um, there. So I'm going to ask a few people, uh, quite a number of people actually, to please stand and I would just like to um, thank them for the work that led up to today. There's so many people to thank our planning team, our awesome planning team rather, let me add that adjective in front of the noun, and um, our uh, table facilitators who are going to be here later today, our um, greeters and uh, table uh, registrants. So for those of you in the room, if you wouldn't mind, please standing so we can give you a round of applause. There are people who have helped out that aren't here today. I just am so grateful that the artistic work of our two artists uh, who uh, did some fantastic work on this, on these photographs, they gave us permission without cost to be able to use them and that's such an attractive piece and that's that goodwill spirit that really has uh, pervaded this whole effort. So, um, and let me just start off with an excerpt from the League's policy position on immigration. Rooted in the belief that our democracy is enhanced by the diversity of voices, the League believes that a path to citizenship or provisions for unauthorized immigrants already in the U.S. to earn legal status will strengthen our nation and our society. There is much more information on the League's position and I encourage you to go to the National League website for the uh, larger, uh, more detailed information on our position. Ours is a country of immigrants. Even though our earliest European settlers could be said to be undocumented, they were not given permission to come or to stay by those already on this land. Since then, our government has enacted many laws on immigration to expand or restrict it, and that has certainly changed over time. As a society, immigra immigration impacts us individually and collectively, directly and indirectly, at the southern borders and in our own state. So what is the situation and how best do we make informed decisions and how best do we communicate our views with our elected officials? Well, we're here today to learn and I'm so grateful that you are here today for, that, for these efforts. To start off with, I'm just going to share a few quick facts with you uh, specific to Wisconsin. Um, and this is according to the American Immigration Council report that there are 278,981 immigrants living in Wisconsin. That's almost 5% of the state's population, of which 45.4% were naturalized citizens. According to the Pew Research Center, there are approximately 80,000 unauthorized immigrants. 
115,747 people in Wisconsin um, have at least one unauthorized family member between the years of 2012 and 2014. As of 2016, there are over 8,000 deferred action for childhood arrivals, or otherwise called DACA, recipients. They represent 81% of the DACA eligible immigrants in Wisconsin. In Milwaukee alone, there is an estimated 2,850 DACA children and young adults. These individuals could be our neighbors, fellow faith members, our children's friends. Today's presentations by Professors Falone and Buff and UWM student um, Mrs. Gar Ms. Garcia Rojas will provide us with a, a better understanding of the immigration situation specific to DACA and uh, families who are in the Immigration and Customs Enforcement custody in that situation. Now I would like to introduce Daniela Lopez Garcia from Alverno, she is an Alverno College student who will explain our brief chairs segment. Right after that, we will invite Kathleen Dunn to begin our panel presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Daniela, and as you can see, there's posters around, and the planning team heard an idea from students filled or affiliated with YES, which is Youth Empowered and the Struggle, and the Struggle. These are high school students who advocate for policies which support Dreamers' access to citizenship. They recommended that we highlight the daily experiences of unauthorized immigrants and Dreamers living in Milwaukee. We honor their requests by asking you to please notice the several chairs that have a poster on them. The message on them reflects li lived experiences for unauthorized immigrants and Dreamers and could be a reason why they are not among us today. I will read them off to you. I am not here today because I am afraid an ICE agent may be present. I am not here today because I don't drive unless it's absolutely necessary. I am not here today because I work two jobs to support my family. I am not here today because I don't belong. I am not here today because I am ashamed. And I am not here today because I feel like I'm a target for people's anger. We ask you to keep these experiences in mind when you have the opportunity to inform elected officials of your views on immigration reforms. Thank you. Good morning, I'm glad there are so many people here. What an incredibly important issue deeply important to this country. It's hard to keep track of all the issues, but thank you League of Women Voters for addressing this issue and for really knowing how to throw an event. These women are great, <laughs> and men. <laughs> President George Washington said, the bosom of America is open to receive not only the opulent and respected stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations and religions whom we shall welcome to a participation of all our rights and privileges. The nation's first immigration law of 1790 didn't quite live up to that promise. It excluded American Indians, indentured servants, and there were many of those, slaves and free African Americans. Women were included, but there were challenges in the early 1800s to women becoming naturalized citizens. President Donald Trump in November said, we are not releasing them, asylum seekers, into our country any longer. They'll wait there at the border for long periods of time. We will be putting up massive cities of tents. We have thousands of tents. We have a lot of tents. <laughs> we have a lot of everything. We are going to hold them right there. Thousands of children have been separated from their parents. There is a promise of a wall. Children of undocumented will have to grow to adulthood in this country facing an uncertain future. 
We have news just in the last week that HHS documents show that thousands of alleged incidents of sexual abuse against unaccompanied minors who have been in custody. It's a disturbing situation. What has happened to us in 229 years? We have a terrific panel for you today who will give a complete explanation of who is allowed in this country in this, at this particular time, who is being held back, why, what our history is. It's hard to go through 229 years, but we have a difficult history with immigration in the United States and we will get from our guests an explanation of why that is the case and how difficult it has been. We have three people with you, and by the end of this, you will really know a lot more about immigration, and I'm so glad we're highlighting that today. Ed Fallone is our first presenter today. Ed is currently an associate professor of law at Marquette University Law School. His primary areas of teaching and scholarship include constitutional law, corporate law, immigration law, and white collar crime. He graduated from the Boston University School of Law and also from his bachelor's Boston University in Spanish language and literature. He has served on a number of organizations, including the board of directors of Voces de la Frontera Acción. Um, he also ran for the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 2013 seeking to become the first Latino to serve as a justice, and he got a lot of votes. Not enough. <laughs> Maybe he'll run again. Ed will give us... Ed knows what our current immigration policy is and will give you a complete explanation of who's allowed in, um, and we welcome him to the microphone. Ed, do you want to talk from there? Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, it's an important issue. Uh, who, who becomes a member of our society, of our country, is probably the most important issue we can make as a nation. Um, and unfortunately, uh, something that uh, gets demonized and obscured by rhetoric and political posturing. And so it's important for us to try and learn the facts. Um, my main point is simply going to be to describe what the law says about who is lawfully entitled to come to our country. Um, and I think what I'd like to, to do with this explanation is, is demonstrate that it doesn't make a lot of sense to get angry at individuals because they're not doing something that the law doesn't let them do. And it doesn't make sense to get angry at individuals for doing something that the law says they can do. Um, the problem could be the law. And maybe the law needs to be changed. Um, I'm sure all of us have different feelings on immigration and who should be allowed to come to our country and who should not. And those feelings should be reflected in what the law says. And our elected officials have passed a law, the Immigration and Nationality Act. There have been for the last 30 years bipartisan calls to amend that act and change the law. But Congress has not. And until they do so, we're stuck with the law as written. So let me explain the basic outline of who is entitled to enter our country lawfully. Um, we take roughly around a million people every year as legal immigrants to join our country and come to the United States. They start as permanent residents and then eventually, um, if they qualify, they move on and they are eligible to become citizens, although there's no requirement that they take that second step. And they fall into four broad categories. Um, the first is family-based connections. Um, and that's by far the largest category. Um, and these are people who are close nuclear family relatives to US citizens for the most part, and in a few cases um, to permanent residents already here. And the goal is family reunification, but just the nuclear family. This does not apply to uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents, no. We're talking about immediate relatives, which are defined as a spouse or minor child or a parent of a US citizen, or the adult children of US citizens, or the spouse or child of a permanent resident already here, 
or adult children of US citizens who are married and will be bringing along a spouse, or brothers and sisters of US citizens. And so those are the family connections. They are tight nuclear family definitions. And there's a limited number of visas that are available every year. Uh, Congress has created a, a number, about 480,000 visas are available. Now there are far more people who apply than are visas available. Far more people than 480,000 apply. And it's kind of like Packers season tickets. <laughs> if you apply and there's not one available, you get added to the list. And when there's an opening, then you get your visa. Well, because demand is quite high, it's a multiple year wait to come in. Beyond that, there's a second uh, quota, and that's a per country quota. Because, as you might expect, there are some countries where the demand based on an immediate relative connection is extremely high. For example, uh, the Philippines, or India, or Mexico, there are already a lot of US citizens who immigrated from those countries and they have relatives alive who are close family members, and so there's a huge demand from those countries. And in order to keep applicants from those high demand countries from overwhelming the entire process, there are quotas, only so many uh, relatives from the Philippines per year, only so many relatives from uh, India per year. And that means that the wait list is even longer, and sometimes up to 30 years waiting. The second category is employment-based. We take about 140,000 persons a year into our country based on their education and their job skills. These are mostly highly educated people. Um, they have national and international reputations in their field. They have advanced degrees, or they have very specialized job skills. Um, there are technically 5,000 visas a year available for what are called other workers. That translates to unskilled. People who have no more than a high school diploma or sometimes not even that. These are people who just want to come and work. And there may be demand for those people. There may be demand in the hotel restaurant industry, the landscaping industry. People may want to hire them as nannies to look after their children. Technically, there's only 5,000 a year. Now imagine how many people without an advanced college degree or without specialized job skills would like to move to the United States and just work hard. Far more than 5,000 a year. So when you look at these employment-based categories, the demand in all of the categories is very large, far more than the 140,000 a year. So we get backlogs and multi multiple year delays. But when it comes to unskilled labor, we're talking 30, 40 years. I mean, people, I, I talk to people all the time who say, I have a, a wonderful person I know in a foreign country. I'd like to have them come to the US to be a nanny for my children. Um, how would that work? I'd say, well, you could apply now. <laughs> and they might get a visa to immigrate here when your kids are celebrating their fifth wedding anniversary. <laughs> You know, your small children will no longer be small children. Um, the third category of people who can come here legally are refugees and political asylees. Refugees are people overseas in camps that have been displaced by war or natural disaster. And the US takes a certain number every year for humanitarian reasons, just like every country takes a certain number of refugees every year. Political asylees are People who are displaced by war or, um, uh, well actually not, not by war, people who are displaced by very specific reasons who have made it to the United States and present themselves. And they say, please don't send me home. And very, it's a very narrow category. It's people who have a well-founded fear of persecution, danger to their life or the life of their family on the base of five rather narrow categories. Persecution based on their race, on their religion, on their um, nationality, on their political opinion, or because of membership in a particular social group, for example, if they are homosexual, transgender, and in their home country, that puts them at risk. Um, 
we had been taking about 100,000 a year combined between these two categories. Um, right now, it, it estimates are will be uh, less than 50,000 um, for 2018. We don't have the final number yet, but the, the numbers have been dropping. And then the fourth category is there's this crazy lottery system where if you are in a country of low immigration to the U.S., where you, there aren't a lot of family members here, you don't, there aren't a lot of job-skilled people from that country, um, and mostly we're talking about Northern Europe and Africa, there's a lottery that you can apply for, and if your name is picked, you get a visa. 50,000 people a year. But the key, if you look at this system, you say, well, you know, who, who can't get in line? You know, and, and really it's unskilled labor um, without a family connection. And that line is so long, it realistically doesn't exist. If you tell someone, yes, wait in line and get a visa to come to the US, but that line is 30 years long, we shouldn't be surprised that perhaps they decide, you know what, I'm gonna come to the border and maybe I'll try to sneak in. I can't wait 30 years. Um, on the other hand, many people are fleeing from Central and South America because of a breakdown in those countries. Uh, it's very dangerous. Gangs have overrun many towns. Children are forcibly recruited from a very young age to participate in gang activity. If they refuse, they are killed. The governments of those countries cannot provide protection. And parents are making the very difficult decision that I cannot let my children grow up in this environment. We have to flee. And they're coming to the US. They used to come individually. At first they began just sending their children on their own. Then family units started moving. And now they come in caravans because it's much safer to move in a group. Less risk of getting robbed, sexually assaulted. Um, better chance you get access to food and health care on the way if you're traveling in a large group. And so they present themselves at the US border. And the law says they are entitled to make a claim for political asylum they are entitled to make a claim that they face persecution on the basis of membership in a social group. Um, people who are targeted because they refuse to let their children join a gang. Whether or not they have a successful claim, the law says they're entitled to make that claim and have a judge hear it. But the system is overwhelmed. Over 700,000 open political asylum requests. Not nearly enough judges. And when you look at the border situation and what's going on, it, I think it really just comes down to deterrence. We don't want to let them make their claims. So let's just make life miserable for them at the border and maybe they'll just leave without doing what the law says they can do. Um, I'm probably gonna be pushing up on the end of my time here, but let me then explain the legal background of the DACA and Dreamer situation. Because in those four categories that I presented, with the exception of people seeking political asylum who present themselves uh, at the border or have already entered and then after entering present themselves within a year, with the exception of political asylum, all of those legal categories are people who are outside the United States. There is simply no category for people who are already in the United States who are undocumented to get legal status. There's no way for someone who was brought here as a small child and discovers, usually it's around the time when, you know, most of their classmates are getting driver's licenses, and they ask, well, why aren't I getting a, you know, why aren't I attending driving school? Why aren't I getting a license? And then the family members, their parents explain, well, actually you're not a citizen, and you may not be eligible. Um, that's when they discover that they're not a citizen. And there's no way to move them from undocumented to legal status. And the median age, the age at which most of these, well, the middle age, if you line them up in a line and you go right to the middle, the middle age that someone was brought to this country who qualifies as a dreamer was six years old. So they had no choice in the matter, they had no say. And the law doesn't provide a vehicle. And the DACA program essentially says, look, until Congress fixes this, until Congress changes the law to provide a way and there have been calls for this for 30 years, hasn't happened yet. Until Congress fixes this, uh, under the Obama administration, they adopted a policy. We'll low priority, we'll give you a low priority for deportation. We promise for a two year period, if you apply, and if you don't have any criminal problems, if you uh, pass the eligibility criteria, for the next two years, we promise not to deport you. 
and you can at least plan your life, you can at least get a job and work lawfully, and we'll keep renewing it and promise not to deport you as long as you continue without any criminal record being employed um, until such time as Congress gets around to creating a legal way for you to stay permanently. And that really is the heart of the Dreamer uh, uh, program and DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival. So I think my time is up, so I will leave it at that and uh, let someone else talk. Okay. Let Thank you, Ed. And just a reminder that you all have cards. If something comes into your mind as you hear someone speak and you want to ask a question, please fill out those cards because we're going to go to question and answer in just a moment. We do have another representative here, which is great because I want to ask Ed a question and uh, we're happy to have somebody from Sen Senator Tammy Baldwin's office here. Uh, Vanessa Giannis, you want to, where are you? Thank you, Vanessa, for being here. And let me just briefly ask you, Ed, before we go to Rachel, what is keeping Congress from fixing this? Oi. Oi. Yeah. yeah, Rachel said oi. Um, well, um, I, I think as in many issues, unfortunately, and I hate to be cynical about this, um, if you're an elected politician running for office, solving the problem takes away a really good campaign issue. Um, if you're running for office for one political party, um, being able to say, you know, build the wall, build the wall, we need to build the wall. And if, if, if you actually built the wall, that would take away your issue, right? And on the other side, if you're saying, you know, pathway to citizenship for the dreamers, pathway to citizenship for the dreamers, and if we actually change the law to create it, well, that would take away your issue. So this is, immigration, unfortunately, is one of many issues where there is the possibility of a reasoned middle ground People of both political parties could agree on some sort of compromise, but the politicians see it as a great way to energize the base at election time. And I just think that keeps them from having the resolve to cut a deal, unfortunately. Our next presenter is Rachel Ida Buff. She is a professor of history at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee and director of the Cultures and Communities Program. She's author of Against the Deportation Terror, Organizing for Immigrant Rights for the 20th Century. And I think her next project is Terms of Occupancy. I read this in the Washington Post. AIDS for Asylum Seekers, I changed it. Oh, AIDS for Asylum Seekers. It's a um, It's a, okay. That's her project right now. She wrote a recent piece in the Washington Post how President Trump is dismantling the world's refugee regime. She has a lot to talk about, the history, the current crisis, humanitarian crisis that exists, the separation of children and families, uh, the makeup of the caravans, and I think you'll find her remarks enlightening. Um. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, thanks to the awesome Milwaukee League of Women Voters for organizing this forum and inviting us. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos, dias. Buenos dias. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> um, full disclosure, I don't usually work on Saturdays, but I made an exception for you all. Um, it's really important that in addition to being a break, the Jewish Sabbath is a day in which we envision the world to come, the world that we don't have now the world that we want to see. So I just want to ask you to take a breath and observe Shabbat with me and maybe close your eyes and just think about what we would like to see in terms of immigration and refugee policy. Just take a second. All right, and maybe we can cut circle back to some of those visions because I think we need to keep that front and center in the very cruel and difficult times that we inhabit. I also want to acknowledge that we, and thank the indigenous nations whose land we stand on, Miami, Menominee, Potawatomi. And this talk is called, Deportation is Always Family Separation, or Indefinite Detention Means Never Having to Say You're Sorry. And I want to dive deep into the question of family separation, which I think has been very public for a lot of folks. I, I think we've, a lot of people who don't ordinarily obsess about immigration the way the three of us do, have come to consciousness around the crisis about family separation that was, began to be publicized last spring. And I'm speaking very specifically um, about that, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So this talk will cover the evolution of the private immigration detention system and the entwined issue of the status of 
and treatment of asylum seekers. Um, Ed gave a really good definition of asylum seekers versus refugees. And I'll talk a little more about that also in the sheet I gave you. There's some citations for thinking about, because when he said we're in violation of the law, we're in violation of the national and international laws governing asylum seekers' rights. And it's important that the bar for saying that you had reasonable fear of persecution if returned to your nation of origin was supposed to originally, when all of this was thought out in the wake of the Shoah after World War II in the displaced persons crisis, when the United Nations High Commission on Refugees met in 1951, the idea was to make sure that no one who feared persecution in their home country would have to be returned there. So you are supposed to internationally have the right to set one foot into a country and say, I can't go back and be heard, right? So we are right now as a nation, and we're not the only ones, but we are right now in violation of that internationally certified right. Um, okay, so it's really important in light of the concerns about family separation for me to say that deportation always means family separation. Right? And deportation is actually a very old technology. It goes back to the very first exclusion laws, um, which were against the Chinese in 1875 and 1882. And as the nation struggled with the question of, you know, we don't necessarily want these people here, they're different from us, they won't be good Americans, however, we do love their cheap labor, those kind of questions, which will be familiar from Ed's talk, right? One of the technologies used against the Chinese was deportation and detention at Angel Island on the way in and at various police stations on the way out as people were being shipped back to China and or across the Mexican border. This is Chinese and Asian Americans. And so whenever you have a deportation regime, which we have had in this country, and I'm mostly gonna talk about since nine, in the 1990s, but really since the, the mid 1960s, when there's a deportation regime, that means people are getting picked up and separated from their families. So the crisis we're talking about that people came to consciousness to in the spring of 2018 was specifically about the separation and detention of migrant children, and I'll address that presently. I also want to say really importantly that I think we can think here in Milwaukee that, well, you know, there's a crisis going on at the U.S.-Mexico border. It's very far from here. But it's very important that we imagine this, that we are a border community, right? If you go east, um, you get to Lake Michigan. The Department of Homeland Security is in charge of enforcing border enforcement with all our maritime borders. We're near Mitchell Field Airport, an international airport. Right? So that gives ICE, the Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency, particular extra rights to stop people and ask them for their immigration papers without anything else being operative. Right? So you might not feel that we're at the border, but in many ways we are, and I just want to lift up the representatives from Voces de la Frontera who are here, um, Sari, Martin, and I forget your name, I met you, Julio? These guys are here, they have a table. They're doing really important work about the rights of the undocumented people who are here because the people who are undocumented in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin live in fear, as Danielle pointed to the signs around here, of ICE being anywhere, of driving. Now, our new governor has said that he supports driver's license or driver's cards for undocumented migrants. <laughs> Because without that, you are perennially at that border stop every time you get in your car to take your kids to school, every time you go to work, every time you go to the supermarket for a quart of milk, you're thinking as if you were going through a checkpoint in Tijuana or between San Diego and Los Angeles, or you know, that's your situation. So there will be a lobby day in Madison on March 14th, and the Voces folks have more information about it. So deportation originated as a technique against the Chinese, used against many, many immigrant groups, used against foreign-born so-called radicals throughout the 20th, 20th century, resurges along with waves of xenophobia after the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act, which Ed, Ed was speaking from, it, which changed the quotas from nationality-based quotas to family reunification and work preference. 
really started to change the character of immigrants who were coming to this country. So we had more Asians, more Africans, um, and an increase in Western Hemisphere immigration from the, from the Caribbean and Latin America. And there was a perception that we, which means white, um, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant Americans, were becoming overwhelmed by them. So there are these waves of xenophobia. We're in one right now, fear of the foreign born taking something unspecified perennially away from us who are white and belong here. And so deportation becomes a way of um, taking unauthorized migrants and putting them back across the border or, or shipping them back to their homelands. Um, so I want to trace the way that this entwines with the question of asylum seeker. Since the Refugee Act of 1980 in the United States brought us into compliance with international policy adopted by the United Nations in 1967. The Refugee Act of 1980 was specifically addressing the crisis in Southeast Asia, which tracks American involvement in military conflict in Southeast Asia. This is always true. People don't turn up at our borders because they, they just thought it was a nice idea to flee their homelands and everyone they ever knew, right? You know, Warsan Shir, the Somali British poet who I always quote at such forums, says, you don't put your child in a leaky boat unless the water is safer than the land, right? You leave because you have to. And often you have to because your country has been made corrupt, difficult, impoverished by the forces of US empire. There's really no other way to say that. So the Refugee Act of 1980 gets adopted um, under Jimmy Carter, actually, and Ronald Reagan comes into office, and the idea is, well, we were involved in Vietnam, we owe the so-called boat people from Southeast Asia, particularly among veterans, something. We need to help these people, we need to have humanitarian relief. There needs to be both refugee admissions and asylum seekers allowed to come here. At the exact same moment, the crisis in Haiti precipitates, it has been since the late 70s, the Duvalier regimes of first Papa Doc and then Baby Doc, which we were very, very supportive of and we funded them. This is a coercive terrorist regime that interrogated and murdered its own people on a regular basis. Boatloads of Haitians start taking to the Caribbean Sea to try and seek refuge in the United States. And so Reagan is tasked with the, he has to appear to adhere to the newly passed Refugee Act but at the same time, he does not want, and his administration do not want, waves of Afro-diasporic immigrants coming into our country. So the Reagan administration starts to pick up Haitians at sea and dump them back in Haiti, no questions asked. Remember that principle of non-refoulement? You're not supposed to be returned to a place you're afraid to go back to? So what? If they, they, if they didn't make it to the shore, we don't have to listen to that. So the Coast Guard's like patrolling the Caribbean Sea, dumping people back in Haiti. Oh, the Tonton Makut, the secret police of the Duvaliers killed your brother, sorry, boom you know, whatever. But many Haitians make it here, right? So this is the beginning of the private immigration detention complex. So in the beginning, they're kind of housing people wherever they can. That's the origins of Guantanamo as a detention center. And when people make it to this country, we start using like local prisons, you know, let's, let's put them here. And that, that just booms, right? Because Haitians are coming at the same time, the 1980s, those of you who study Latin American history, is a time where the US is deeply involved in supporting some fairly despotic, murderous thugs in Central America. There's really no other way to say this. Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, well, we're using Honduras as a place to stage our battles, Nicaragua, under the sort of renewed Cold War where Reagan sort of praised the, um, these folks as the moral equivalent of the American founding fathers. So there's a huge refugee crisis in Central America, there's a huge refugee crisis in the Caribbean, people are coming here, we are not recognizing them as asylum seekers. We are instead building for the first time, specific immigration jails to house them that are privately funded by groups like GEO and Core Civic. Okay, so the most important thing I'll say today is private detention corporations are politically powerful entities. And surprisingly, Margarita and I thought when Trump got elected, oh, deportations are gonna spike. They haven't, you know, um, Reagan, uh, Obama was deporting a lot of people, the administrations before him did a lot of people, deported a lot of people. You know what spiked is detentions. You know what's lucrative for those corporations? Detentions. So we have at this point a private, powerful lobbying interest that wants to build more and more and more and more immigration prisons. So there's more and more and more, unsurprisingly, reasons that people get jailed. So 
this is also, I should say, the very interesting 1980s, which as a historian I could go long on, but I, I will try not to. This is also the founding of the first US sanctuary movement, which happens because US church groups have been going and on witness tours to Central America. And they come back and they say, it's really not what you're reading in the paper. The United States is not bringing freedom to El Salvador. The United States is supporting people who kill women and children and entire villages on a regular basis throughout this region. So the churches get involved in this network between Central America and the United States, and they start listening to the words of people like um, Archbishop Romero, Oscar Romero, who was a liberation theologian later in his life, who was murdered while saying mass in 1980. And Romero said before they murdered him, you should go with the poor people. You should go with the campesinos. You should stand with them when the military is approaching them. That's, that's the moral and ethical and Christian thing to do. So the sanctuary movement, and we have the director of the new sanctuary movement here today, and he, he inherits this very proud history of churches, synagogues, mosques, Jesse Jackson's Operation Push movement in Chicago, um, indigenous nations in Florida saying, you know, we, we will shelter you because our government, 3% of Salvadorans throughout the 80s are getting recognized as asylum seekers. The rest, because they're Latino and they're brown, are being, oh, you know, you're an, undocu you're an undocumented migrant. If we apprehend you, you're going to our private de detention centers. Okay, so that is a little bit, very much, the complex that we're at now. Um, a couple more facts. So in 1996, the last federal immigration reform policy to pass, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Responsibility and Immigrant Control Act, rolls right off your tongue. That might not even be right, but something like that, ERIRA, makes a lot of um, regulations, enhances deportation, de the deportability of many foreign-born um, populations, including groups like Cambodians. Many of people who have grown up here and never seen their homeland, were brought here very young, can be deported for a multitude of offenses. It also mandates the detention of asylum seekers. So let me just say this is not what the UNHCR had in mind in 1951 when they were responding to the, global, the humanitarian crisis of displaced persons. The idea, if you go back and read, and I really encourage you to go to the website on the sheet I handed out, if you go back and read what the UNHCR did in 1951, refugees and asylum seekers are supposed to have the right to papers, the right to education, the right to work. They're supposed to be able to enter a country and while they're waiting for that immigration court to make a decision, they're supposed to be able to have a life. But in 1996, we decided, no, they're going to be detained. Okay, this is a Clinton policy, so this is bipartisan. These private detention centers give a lot of money to both sides. They have a lot of power. In 1998, and this is also under the Clinton administration, a federal judge rules in Flores versus Reno that when a parent is being taken into detention, into custody, the child, if they have to be separated, should be given to first a family member, first another parent, a family member, a legal guardian, last, last, you know, last resort, possibly a state representative, or a child-centered facility for the shortest time possible. It's important that the Trump administration is trying to overturn Flores versus Reno because it certifies certain rights for um, children, the children of undocumented entry, enters, entries. Oh, there's lots to say here. Um, it's important that in 2001, with the, um, after 9-11, and I think we inherit this now in the Muslim ban, many of the most dangerous countries in the world which produce refugees and asylum seekers are now places we don't let anyone in from. Because we've, this is a longer story that I'm gonna make pretty short because I think I might be running out of time. Um, we have now equated being Muslim with possibly being a terrorist. So the notion that, you know, Muslims seeking refuge from, oh, you know, the civil war in Syria, the bloodiest war taking place on the globe right now in Yemen, you know, um, that those folks are, are criminalized and have less access to refuge or asylum. In 2009, under Obama, Congress passes a, a 35,000 bed mandate saying there have to be 35,000 beds in immigration detention ready at all times. This has now gone up to 50, and the compromise that Congress made was said 45. 
we're at a place where 45,000 people in immigration jail for no crime every night is, is viewed as normal. That's normalized. That's what the Democrats said. Like, oh, that seems reasonable. 45,000 people, uh, you know. Okay. I also want to say, okay, so I want to address the current crisis for a couple of minutes, the, the border wall crisis. It's important to say that since 2005, 7,000 people have died trying to cross the border. And that's because in the waves of xenophobia since the late 90s, specifically Operation Gatekeeper, which was a popular and then a, a immigration of, uh, imperative at the US border in California, more and more wall is being built. There are 700 miles of wall right now, right? So it's harder and harder to come around come through, you, people are forced further east into the desert, people are forced to use the services of coyotes. Um, it's more and more dangerous to cross the border. Meanwhile, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, austerity in Central America and the Caribbean, and most recently the US-backed coup in Honduras in 2009 have made Central America and the Caribbean dangerous places to live, difficult places to gain a livelihood. So the standoff that we see now it at the border, starting in the spring, has a history in terms of detention and in terms of the instability visited upon these regions. I was in Tijuana in January, volunteering with the New Sanctuary Coalition's um, Sanctuary Caravan, 40 Days and 40 Nights in the Desert, and I was very surprised to learn that many of the asylum seekers in the caravan Many of them are Honduras, Honduran, many of them are from Central America, many of them are Caribbean. There are people from Europe, there are people from West Africa. And as Ed said, these are people who have done the, to me, beautiful human act of solidarity, of walking together over land, because the places they come from are dangerous and they cannot make a living, right? And our country right now is at this place. So the zero tolerance policy adopted last spring by Jeffrey Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, who also cut down the number of immigration judges who can hear asylum seekers. The zero tolerance policy said every asylum seeker trying to cross is a criminal. Every asylum seeker trying to cross deserves to be immediately incarcerated, their children should be separated, and, and this is again unconstitutional under the law of the land, which is Flores versus Reno, their children should be separated from them and incarcerated as well. And this was very specifically to deter other asylum seekers. And this, there's like a logical flaw here. You know, if, if you're trying to deter somebody who's fleeing for, for their life, what's that move? Like, stop fleeing for your, for your life, you idiot. We're going to be really mean to you. Like, you still have to, you have to flee, you have to flee. Again, nobody, nobody has breakfast and then says, oh, you want to flee? Okay, we'll flee, right? You flee because you have to. So where we are now is we're violating our own laws. We're violating basic human rights. We are taking down the fairly fragile consensus that emerged after 1951 internationally through the United Nations that somehow as humans and as nations, we owe asylum seekers something. All right, I'm going to stop there. Just a reminder to fill out the questionnaires. I'm sure that both of the people who have already presented have brought questions to your mind, and we're going to get to you uh, in just a little while. Just a question to you, Rachel, is, I mean, there's a huge, as you talk about the moral and ethical component to all of this. It, it, my question is, why isn't that front and center? Why is it that we, a large majority of people in this country believe that those who are trying to enter, and you've beautifully outlined what's driving them to enter, think that they're criminals and they're rapists and they're, I mean, there's a, a lack of seeing suffering humanity as suffering humanity and it's pervasive. How did that happen and how do we change that? I mean, let's, let's bear in mind that best case scenario, 30% of Americans want the wall built. And those, those, those people are in the sway of this particular administration and of you know, certain news sources like Fox that you know, just, just are spin machines for xenophobia all the time. So how does it get to be a majority? You know, how how, I mean, I think what Ed said about congressional inaction and politics is important. I think racism is important. 
right? You know, so it's your fellow human, and you know, this was even true in the history of the UN's um, immigrant and refugee policy. The first one in 1951, they were just thinking Europeans. And full disclosure, in the US with the Displaced Persons Acts of 1948 and and 1949, 50,000, we only accepted 50,000 at a time then. We did not accept a lot of Jews, right? So it was, it, you know, there's this very interesting contradiction where the Shoah is the reason for re refugee policy. It's limited to Europe and it's still anti-Semitic. <laughs> um, we're, still, we're still doing that. So I think it's a combination of politics as Ed outlined, you know, the 30% who seem to be you know, in the sway of what I would call right-wing po populism. I think a lot of the folks you see coming out for white nationalist rallies and explaining things with like very logical theories like Jews are trying to replace you. I was really confused by this. Like I'm not trying, I don't even know what that would mean. Um, I think those, those folks have grievances, but I think that the, what's causing their problem is not immigrants and people of color. I think what's causing their problem is a neoliberal economy that immiserates the middle class in the United States. Can, can I just interject real quick? I just, I think that um, we, I never blame people when they're told certain things and they don't understand that that's not true. I don't blame them for necessarily believing those things. So if people are told that, you know, there is no right of asylum, that these people showing up have no right, um, then, then they're just going to say, well, this is terrible. They're showing up. They have no right to show up. I, I think the problem comes from the leadership misexplaining and demonizing. Um, and so I don't necessarily blame people who, who are in favor of building the wall or who, who attend rallies in support of lower immigration. When they're being fed misinformation, I blame the people who are feeding them the misinformation. Yeah, which is why forums like this one need to happen all over the darn country, right? Um, and now we're going to hear a very important story from someone who represents all these signs that are very moving that are here today. Margarita Garcia Rojas is a student at UW-Milwaukee, and she's majoring in Latin American Studies and History. And she's been working with Dr. Rachel Buff since 2017 to create the documentary, documenting deportation archive. Uh, she was born in Mexico, migrated at the age of three, has lived in Milwaukee ever since, and she will talk about her own experience, which is such a crucial part of this discussion. Her current research project, So American It Hurts, Stories of the 1.5 Generation, which focuses on the experience of growing up in an undocumented or a mixed status family. Margarita. Hello everyone, I'm Margarita and I'll be discussing my current research project, So American It Hurts, Stories of the 1.5 Generation. Before I continue, I would like to dissect my title for you and the idea behind it. First, the term Generation 1.5 refers to immigrant youth. Those born in another country but grew up the majority, majority of their life, in this case, the United States. This is a term that started emerging in the early 70s largely to refer to Korean immigrant youth. And what links the experience of this group is the shared challenge of balancing the traditional values of their native culture while growing up American. And as difficult as it is to navigate between cultures and identities, the uncertainty of legal status for themselves or their family members complicates the matter. And sometimes despite legal status and their established American identity can begin to feel denied, especially because of anti-immigrant policies and rhetoric. Hence, the first part of the title, So American It Hurts, which I took directly from um, John Languizamo's Netflix special. Um, and so part of my project this phase is to collect the stories of people that identify with this term. 
And although some may be too young to remember their migration journey, it's critical for their stories and experiences to be preserved in order to dismantle the negative narratives of who immigrants are, understand the complexity of their identity formation, and how they see themselves in American society, and especially how childhood experiences have affected this. So I drew from my experience as an immigrant and feeling out of place as I grew up and even now. Sentiments that were heightened when the fear of my uncle being deported has become a sudden and approaching reality. My youngest uncle was 18 when he crossed by himself. He was the one that provided the resources for my mom, my grandma, eldest uncle, and I uh, to make it. I was only three at the time. We left Mexico City on May 29th, 2000, and made it to Beloit, Wisconsin on June 19th. 18 years later, he's the only person my mom and I have left from our immediate family here. He has always been, oh, he has always been like a father to me. My mom used to tell me that as we crossed, I would ask him, I would ask about him as I was really anxious to see him. I have shaped my life and my career goals primarily with him and my mom in mind. I've often felt guilty that he sacrificed his life but really hasn't reaped any of the benefits. He provides for his family but wakes up every day uncertain about his drive to and from work. And although he puts on a brave face, I have begun to see the stress and anxiety weighing on him, just thinking of the possibility that soon he might get separated from his family. Growing up, I would ask my mom about the journey all the time and I would replay the scenarios and images that she described to me <laughs> in my mind all the time. Some are. My mom having to internalize the pain of needles from nopales or cactus along her shins as she crawled. My grandma almost giving up because we ran out of water and she didn't feel she could keep up. La Migra or Border Patrol catching us twice before we made it. Treating the adults poorly and feeding them only peanut butter which is why my mom hates peanut butter today, <laughs> while I was given water and a pink stuffed bunny, which I eventually dropped somewhere in the desert. La Migra almost taking me away because they assumed I was stolen, since my mom's skin is um, far darker than mine's. And ultimately, my powerful cries interrupted them from doing this. I was told by my grandma that the first words that my mom said when we got here was, I made it, and I'm not leaving until I'm kicked out. And I think this first picture, oh, the slide before, uh, this first picture um, when I was younger in this laundromat, I think this first picture echoes this statement. And when I see her face in this picture, I see resilience. Uh, she was determined to give me a better life, and like other immigrant parents, she began her new life, figuring out things on her own in this new society that I had and still have trouble figuring out and understanding as I transitioned to adulthood. These are the experiences I had um, that con and continue to have that have an enormous influence on who I am, what my choices are, and how I see myself in American society. Here, but not really part of it um, still. So what I'm looking to capture in, my, in the interviews of um, the people I've talked to is to how um, is how and to what impact their childhood experiences uh, being an immigrant, whether or not they didn't fully understand what that meant, um, affected their lives today, or back then if they, they did understand. Additionally, I'm interested in who they are and what makes them happy. Um, these charts indicate how many of them experience discrimination and identity conflict. Um, Moments are discussed in their interviews. And the reason that some responded no uh, to this questionnaire is because they lived in parts of towns um, very secluded with people similar to them. Um, and this is where location has played a huge role in the experiences I've noticed. Um, there was a young lady I interviewed who grew up on the south side of Milwaukee who grew up feeling okay, pretty good. Uh, she then moved to West Allis to a majority white high school and encountered some serious racism and discrimination uh, just because she was a Mexican immigrant. And she dealt with a principal who said, immigration was not doing their job because she was in the country. 
And this was after she went to ask for permission to create a yes chapter, a youth empowered, youth empowered in the struggle chapter at her high school. He further responded with, if I allow a pro-immigration group in this high school, I will have to allow an anti-immigration group and you will get your feelings hurt. Despite, um, despite all of this, she was strong and she didn't let the comments phase her too much. She took action and started working with organizations like Voces de la Frontera. The participants in my project have mostly been from Mexico, but there are people who have reached out to me um, who are from Nicaragua, Ethiopia, Morocco, and Chile. Half of them are naturalized and the other have DACA. Some are in the process. Um, not every story that I heard was the same as I didn't expect them to be, but I was surprised to see the elements of similarities between them. For most, it wasn't until high school, like Ed said, when they realized they couldn't do the same things as their friends, like work, drive, or travel far. There was some that never spoke about their situation, their status, or their families, not even to their best friends, and they spent their entire life keeping this to themselves. And I would like to just share that this has been my favorite part of this phase of my project, seeing their joy and their sadness and all their emotions, because this is the first time that they really have gotten the chance to say anything. Uh, things that they felt they needed to hide or were oblig obligated to hide. The other is that mothers were instrumental in the decision to leave. They were instrumental in economic and emotional support. A, particip a participant mentioned how blown away they were by how hard their mother had worked. And their jobs, her, their mother's jobs took notice. Uh, but every time they would attempt to promote her, uh, she would have to find another job because she didn't have uh, the social security or whatever she needed to move on higher up. There are some that feel that it would be okay if they stayed, if something were to happen to their parents, because they're working towards a degree. And many said they were willing to go back with their parents if something were to happen to them. There are, there is a lot of frustration and uncertainty in uh, these people's lives. Um, it wasn't until now for a lot of them that they had to start thinking of a plan if something were to happen to their parents. Uh, and a lot of their parents don't have a plan for them. They just say, if something were to happen and you come home and we're not home, just sit at the dinner table and pretend that we're here. Um, and, and that's something that's very hard for them. But that's where they are. It's a mixed group of people um, with very different experiences. But, yeah. Thank you. And Marguerite, if you want to respond to this, or Ida and Ed as well, can you um, explain a little more of the process you have to go through with DACA that you have to every two years register again? And my understanding is that a lot of those are being held up at this point in time, so it's difficult even to to uh, to, to register to get a, a, a DACA status. Um, well, from what okay, from what I know right now, um, it's being held up through the courts, and I think they are allowed to keep um, re-registering their their uh, their status, but I'm not. Yeah. Sure. Look at new. Are they new? Or renewed? They can, uh, what, new, but are they new? what happened is that the um, Trump administration inherited the DACA program. And despite President Trump during the campaign uh, speaking favorably of the Dreamers and saying, we're going to take care of this, don't worry, um, once he became president, he rescinded the DACA program. Um, and that turned into a legal fight as to whether he had the authority to do it the way he did it, um, basically by just saying, oh, it's over. Um, there's legal arguments that while the president has great authority, he can't act arbitrarily. He has to have reasons. And what were the reasons? He didn't go through kind of the homework part of being president. Um, and, and so in the litigation now, we have uh, order from a federal judge um, that the program has to be allowed to continue pending the end of the litigation. Uh, 
So students who at first were traumatized because they thought the program had been terminated were then told, well, the courts say you can renew and you can stay in the program, but there's still that uncertainty, what happens if it reaches the US Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court says President Trump acted within his authority, then the program would be over. So there is still a great deal of anxiety. And is DACA, can you be a new DACA student? Are there new DACA? No, you have to have been someone who had previously applied. Right, so there's gonna be a backlog of people graduating from high school, which there has been. And I just wanna say another thing about DACA. It's really important to acknowledge that we only have DACA because of the dream activists of the 2000s. It wasn't like Obama was like, hey, that'd be nice. It was that young people protested, got themselves arrested and thrown into detention, you know, sat in. That's why we have this. I also want to say that the very first thing Scott Walker did when he got in office in 2010 was end in-state tuition in Wisconsin, which we had fought for here and had had since 2009. We had 18 months of in-state tuition. Just saying. And Margarita, when you are doing your project and you ask the question, which is an interesting one, what would make you happy? What kind of responses do you get? I usually ask them, um, like, what are their most memorable experiences growing up? And they tell me, you know, anything with their family, just any sort of moment, like a big laugh that they had with their family. Um, a lot of them are very driven. A lot, what makes them happy is, you know, studying and like making their family happy. Um, that's one of like the main things that I've heard from the people I've talked to. Mm -hmm. And your uncle, what, what does he have to do on a daily basis to f not get noticed? Well, um, he's, he lives in a smaller town near Beloit, um, and that's been difficult because the sheriffs kind of already know his car. Um, I've done some things to help him not get so noticed, um, uh, putting my car or his car under my name, um, and he hasn't gotten stopped ever since we've done that because the sheriffs knew his plates and they would stop him regularly. Mm -hmm. So we changed the plates and, and that's helped him out a lot. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we had to do. Is there anything we didn't, before we go to questions, and if somebody wants to bring those up, that would be great, and we'll go to audience questions. Is there anything that you want to re respond to each other on before we go to questions from the audience? Something that was said that struck you? Well, I'd, I'd just like to thank Margarita for being here and speaking. You know, one thing I've seen over the years, um, I've been talking on immigration topics for almost 30 years in public events, but once the dreamers began attending and self-identifying and saying, hey, I'm here undocumented and my life has value, that started to move public opinion. And it's so important for Margarita and other individuals to put a human face on these issues, just the same way that you know, our society evolved over acceptance of gays and lesbians when they began being out of the closet and, and presenting themselves and saying, hey, pay attention. Um, I think this is a very similar civil rights issue. Yeah, I mean, I wanna also thank Margarita, who's amazing and whose research is, I think, just getting started. And I think you'll be hearing from her from some time to come. And I think that a similar thing that Ed is pointing out is operative with the caravans. Like, if they're caravans of criminals and ISIS members, they're scary, right? And it, 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 it's very hard, and I've tried, to find any media coverage of the actual real people caravans, women who had babies walking here, people who carried their children hundreds of miles. These are just our fellow humans, right? But it's very hard to find that. So I, I echo Ed's point that, and I think that responds a little bit to your question before, Kathleen, about why, why people are afraid of immigrants. It's because there's no coverage of immigrants as regular people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to add to that. Um, again, thank you, Rachel. Obviously, I've worked with you for a long time, so I appreciate you a lot. Um, misinformation is, is very important, and it drives a lot of people to say, a lot of terrible things. Um, just for example, the past couple of days, Fox 6 has uh, posted about Evers, his proposal about in-state tuition and uh, driver's license, which the title was worded in a way where you could tell that no one read the article. So you see comments of just hate, hate, hate. Um, for me, I at this point, I kind of just laugh at how 
crazy they sound, um, but at the same time, it does hurt to read that. There's a lot of people who don't know what's going on. They only get what they know from titles of news stories. So it's good to come to forums like these, good to talk to people, to actually understand experiences, because if not, you're just uh, uh, accepting and regurgitating what uh, news gives to you. And I think this connects to the attack we've had in our state about higher ed. I met Margarita in a survey class. And in that class, there was one particular guy, you'll remember who I'm talking about, who was very like, I graduated from the military. I don't like refugees. I don't like immigrants. And he sat every day at a table. And the class was majority non-American born with kids who were like, oh, well, you know, what's the homework? Um, and I won't say that the guy changed and is now an immigrant advocate, but higher education, edu public education is where people change their minds. You know, and, and the, so the, the war against public education in the state is very much linked to, like, if, if people are ignorant, xenophobia requires ignorance. You know, people get in a class like that one and they're like, oh, this person seems remarkably like somebody I could get the homework from, you know? <laughs> Do you think, um, you mentioned the driver's license permit and in-state tuition. Is there any chance that's going to pass the Wisconsin legislature? Hell yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> there, there are arguments that should appeal to people on both, in both political parties. Mm -hmm. That if you have individuals who are present in the state of Wisconsin, we should make sure they can be productive. And the way they can be productive is if they can drive and get a job and pay taxes. You know, if they have a job, they're gonna pay taxes. And people say, oh, well, you know, undocumented people don't pay taxes. No, they do. Every time they buy something, they're paying the sales tax. You know, I always say, well, drive by Miller Park, which was funded by the sales tax. <laughs> Immigrants pay just as much for Miller Park. Undocumented people pay just as much as Miller Park every time they bought a bag of chips. They pay property taxes. If they rent, part of their rent money is going to property taxes. And many, many undocumented persons pay income tax because they know if there's going to be an amnesty, one of the conditions is going to be a back payment of all owed income taxes. And they figure, well, instead of having to do all that at the end of the process, I'll do it year by year. So they are paying taxes. It benefits the state. And the same, of course, with in-state tuition. Let's let these productive people who are, um, you know, uh, top of their class in high school, let's let them afford to go to college instead of putting them in a, a low-wage job. So it does benefit, and I think when people are educated, they understand both members of both political parties would support it. It's really important that the anti-in-state tuition people publish these faulty math numbers based on the, so they say, oh, it's so expensive, we can't afford in-state tuition for undocumented students, it costs the state money. That's premised on the notion that all the undocumented students who would be let in in-state would pay out of state tuition. They struggle paying in-state tuition, they don't come. We get more revenue with students coming in-state because there's more students. But, the, but the, the other side will publish these crazy numbers. It'll cost us $7 billion to let, in state to, to let undocumented students have in-state tuition. The math is wrong. But that's like a really good talking point. You know, just, just to like, you know, because you, you sort of sometimes have to shake friends of yours, like, no, that math, it doesn't work. See, here's why. And I want to say another thing about VOSA specifically, because we're so fortunate in the state to have an organization that can muster 15,000 people, drive them to the Capitol and say no. That's how things happen. Okay, we have a lot of questions. Um, how much does DACA renewal cost? Yeah. Yeah. Four hundred ninety-five dollars every two years. Yeah. Yeah. Around five hundred. A little, little less around there. Yeah. How many deportations in 2018, for example, from Wisconsin? What triggers deportation in these cases? And are there more now than under the Obama administration? I, I've heard that Obama deported a number of people as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we have um, the 2018 figures. Um, immigration statistics, it takes a while for them to get published and put on the official website from Department of Homeland Security. Um, and it may even be 2016 as the last complete year that's been published. But basically, um, it, deportation spiked under President Obama 
and I think it was a, a political tactic. He wanted to show he was tough on the immigration issue so that he could get a comprehensive immigration reform deal through Congress. Um, so he wanted to look tough. And um, it didn't work. And so instead what he did is he, he ramped up deportations until the immigrant community really began complaining. Look at what they're doing. They're devastating our communities and it's Obama that's doing it. Um, and it's, it's continued. Um, what, what President Trump has added is the deterrence aspect. I mean, deportations, the statistics refer to people who have been picked up, they're given a hearing, and then they're actually formally removed from the country. It doesn't pick up all of the people who are deterred from even having an argument or a claim or appearing before a judge because they're just thrown in detention and then just, um, you know, removed even before there's even anything to, to trigger statistics. Here's a question about something that's important, which is the truth. Um, it's addressed to you, Ed. You put the blame on administration leaders and not the common citizens for knowing and telling the truth. Don't citizens have the responsibility to find out the truth? I cannot excuse this. Well, we, we, I think it's an honest question. Um, we live in very interesting times where I happen you know, I'd be, I'm interested in many policy and legal issues. I have to work hard to find accurate information. Um, I, I read, you know, two newspapers a day. It's not the Journal Sentinel. Um, <laughs> I actively go on the internet to certain sites that I trust as sources of information, and I have to work to inform myself um, with accurate information. And and I, you know. I'm a law professor, <laughs> so it, it's even easier for me. So I, I understand how difficult it is for well-meaning citizens who want to inform themselves on public issues who don't happen to be law professors. Where do you go to begin? I understand that. So I have some sympathy for people um, who, who don't have those sources of information. It's, it's the modern world. Um, it used to be you could read the local newspaper, get some idea of what's going on. That's, that's not the case. And, uh, and I, I think we as a society, and thank God for the League of Women Voters and other groups, we as a society really need to grapple with what does it mean to be an informed voter anymore? Absolutely. Who decides, and let, let's um, break this into asylum seekers and refugee seekers. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with Lutheran Social Services the past year, and they're very concerned about the number of ref refugees. I mean, there are millions of people in these camps for years and years and years, and the limit now is 50,000 in the United States. Can you talk about who made the decision to drop that number? Um, I know it's having a profound effect on those who are trying to resettle refugees, and also, um, numbers on asylum seekers, how many, what it used to be, where we are now, and who makes these decisions? Whoever, Ed, do you want to take that, or Rachel? Who? So the Refugee of 1980 Act said that the refugee cap was to be set annually at presidential discretion. And what's important here is the refugee cap is low at 50,000, but we're not using all of those. Right, so there's, um, and uh, another thing I'll say, and then I'll let Ed do the numbers, because I never know numbers. Maybe you do. Um, another thing that's really important to say is you hear a lot about, well, you know, we have to be really careful, we have to really have extreme vetting, which sounds, it's like a great soundbite. If you're in a refugee camp in Kenya, or at the border, or anywhere, you are being vetted. You do not get into this country. It's not like they just round people up and put them on the plane. You have been vetted for weeks and months and years. You have been, you've had Americanization classes. You know, there's, you, you don't, there's no way a refugee gets here through the current refugee regime and has not been vetted for political background and everything else. So that's a bit of a false, um, that's, a, that's, that's just not true. Um, it, it's about a two-year process from, to get from a refugee camp to actually get to the United States. It's about a two-year process of being interviewed, um, background check, um, and, and there's a matching that goes on to see you know, which refugees would fit in, assimilate better to the U.S. versus other countries. Do they have any family or connections to the U.S.? So it takes a long time. Um, and, and if you're a terrorist and you want to come to the U.S. to do horrible things, spending two years in a refugee camp. <laughs> it's, it's not a smart way 
to infiltrate the United States. It's, it's not, it's miserable. Um, the, uh, yeah, Congress uh, gets a number from the uh, president every year of how, what the president expects refugee admissions will be. And uh, we were running at about 100,000 a year combined between overseas refugees and political asylum seekers, um, which are harder to predict because political asylum seekers are harder to predict because it's just people who show up and ask. Um, and the, the Trump administration um, uh, has, has said for 2019 they expect there to be 30,000 refugees admitted if they actually end up using those visas. And, and as Rachel said, they, don't, you know, they can drag their feet and we may find out in the year 2020, oh, well, we only admitted 20,000. So you know, what the actual number is going to be, we know it'll be much, much less. We still don't know exactly what it'll be. And in terms of political asylum, those who are wherever they are right now, and that's another question, we don't know where people are, which is unconscionable. Those people who might still be in Mexico waiting for who knows how long to ask for political asylum here, do we have any numbers of how many will, we will allow? How long are, waiting, are people waiting? And where are they waiting to be able to speak before a court to ask for asylum? So just in Tijuana, there's about 8,000 people waiting to come in. When I was there, and I don't think this has changed, in January, they were letting four, 40 people in a day who would be immediately detained. And I had this question for a while, like, why are they detaining them? But the answer is, it's profitable. Who would be detained for two weeks or two months and then released. And then it takes, as Ed said, a couple of years for their um, cases to make their way through the court. Typically, I think our asylum granting process is about 50%, but it vi varies widely, and it's all about foreign relations, right? Like, you're not going to get asylum from Haiti or for cent from Central America. You know, right now, we might be giving Venezuelans asylum because we're like, oh, yes, that's a repressive regime. You know, El Salvador, a great place to live, right? It's, it's very much about, you know, so during the Cold War, if you wanted asylum from the Eastern Bloc, absolutely, plus you're white, so that's good. Um, but if you wanted, uh, you wanted asylum from a despotic regime, pick one, there's lots of them around the globe that we were supporting. We couldn't, like, we cannot admit refugees from, or asylum seekers from Iraq or Afghanistan because then we would have to say, those are terrible places because we're there making them terrible places, right? So it really varies widely by nationality. And when I was in Tijuana, the people were living in camps, in apartments, the Mexican government has been granting people one year work visas, which is actually sort of compliant with international refugee standards. Um, they're living, you know, some of the camps are tents in the mud. I, I went to one church where there were 50 people living upstairs in one room in the church that was about a quarter of this size, bunk bed to bunk bed to bunk bed to bunk bed. You know, so people are all stashed all over. A woman I met there who's involved in organizing caravans told me there's 18,000 people right now in, in the state of Chiapas, um, another caravan that's debating what to do, where they should go. They're right now camped out in Chiapas. And, and let's, you know, remember, it, it's about someone appears and they say, I want to claim political asylum. I think I want to have a judge hear my case. They're told, well, it's going to be at least two years, maybe three years before there's a judge who can hear your case. And you're going to be in detention that whole time. And if you have a child with you, we're going to take your child away and maybe give that child to someone else. Do you really want to do this or would you rather just withdraw your claim and leave? I mean, that's, that's really the idea of using it as deterrence, is to make seeking something that the law gives you a right to seek so unpleasant and horrible and unimaginable that you will not pursue what the law allows you to pursue and will just turn around and leave. Mm -hmm. Marguerite, did your mother ever think about just turning back? I'm sorry, what was the question? Did your mother, when you were making the long journey, ever think about just turning back, giving she, up? She says no. She's right here. <laughs> She's here. No. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Glad to know you're in the audience. Um, all right, here's kind of a follow-up on this, again, on political asylum. How do you verify a well-founded fear of persecution? Well, you know, credibility determinations are very important because, obviously, if you really are afraid for your life, you don't necessarily stop and say, oh, what documents should I bring with me? You know, I, I used to represent Salvadorans who fled uh, 
you know, political violence in El Salvador, and they get a phone call saying, you know, you're dead, we're coming for you. Um, your mind doesn't think, I better make sure I have evidence with me about this threat. I mean, you run. And so documentary evidence can be very difficult. Um, it really often turns on the credibility of the asylum seeker. And the other main factor is whether that person is represented by a lawyer. If you're represented by a lawyer, far more likely you'll succeed in your claim of political asylum. If you're not represented by a lawyer, far more likely the judge will say, I don't think this is credible, and send you back. Just to add to that, under Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, a lot of things got harder. Like you used to be able to, if you were a battered woman, that was credible fear. Now that's not enough, right? So many people, and this is important to say, many people who have been denied or returned or deported have been murdered. They, say, they come and say, I have credible fear, I'm scared, you know, my ex-boyfriend who is now in a gang is going to kill me. And, and you know, it's, it's if you're credible in the eyes of DHS and they, they have numbers to worry about and, you know, and, and the DHS person says, you know, no, um, that doesn't seem all that credible, you, you have nothing to be afraid of, you, you get bumped back and you really have, you know, so like, once again, in principle, the bar is supposed to be very low. You know, um, in practice, the bar is very high, and it's harder for people of color. It's harder for people who've sustained trauma, which is hovering at like 90% among the caravans, right? Because if you didn't have trauma when you left, walking over several countries will will. So, the the process of of being interviewed is also a re-traumatizing process, right? Yeah, it it I've. I've seen situations where someone is, is raped or they've seen a close family member murdered in front of their eyes and they arrive at the US and they are too traumatized to really explain what they saw. And even talking about it causes the body to relive the experience. And you really need them to get help by organizations that work with torture survivors before they're re ready to share their story. And yet, Department of Homeland Security or an immigration judge says, well, you know, when you told the story, you left out these details, and so I don't believe you. I mean, and so they're really, it is difficult um, for these people sometimes to, to convince the decision maker. Mm -hmm. And you said that it's easier if you have a lawyer. Lawyers cost money. How are people affording to pay for this, or are there a lot of lawyers offering services for free? Uh, immigration law is a very specialized area of the law. There are some very good social service organizations here in Milwaukee. We're very lucky that Catholic Charities uh, provides low-cost legal representation in political asylum cases. Otherwise, um, you have to rely on pro bono lawyers uh, representing people for free. But immigration law is a very specialized area, so it's not like you can typically go to someone who does divorces and say, hey, can you take this case? Um, let's get this one to you first, Rachel. Are open borders the answer, or are they even possible? Is there a fair way to limit immigration? Um, well, in all honesty, I think open borders is the way to go. Uh, I don't think we're going to get there soon. I guess one sort of moderated position would be to say, in the way that international corporations can move, through NAFTA and CAFTA and other fair trade arrangements. So, you know, Mr. Nike has no problem at the border. And, you know, Mr. Nestle has no problem setting up a new plant where the wages are cheaper. If those folks should move, people have the right to move. And we're not even talking here about human rights, just in terms of migration, right? Because I often um, put the UNHCR on a pedestal to make a point that we're in violation of international law. But one really negative thing the Refugee Act, the Refugee Laws does is to say, refugees are deserving and migrants are not deserving. But are you not deserving if you can't feed your family because of international trade policy? Is that really true versus like somebody, like do we really have to make these decisions between, well, she was being beaten by a gang member but she couldn't feed her family, like one of them is good and one of them is bad, really? That's not such a great distinction. So I would say, to the extent that we have a global world, we have got to have a global immigration policy. And we don't. Ed, do you believe in um, an open border? Um, I don't believe in open borders. I think that the, the overall solution is immigration reform. Let's change the US laws to provide a way for unskilled workers 
to actually have a realistic option of getting to the US. Um, I will say this, um, and I often say it, um, walls don't just keep people out, they keep people in. And one of the, the issues is unintended consequences. As we have strengthened border enforcement, we've made it so difficult to actually get into the US that once people are here, they're gonna stay. They're not gonna leave and then try to re-enter in the future. It was too hard. And actually, it didn't used to be that way. When you look at undocumented um, migration in the past, it used to be it was over a time period. You have Mexican farmers, the male head of the household, would leave and come to the US, maybe work uh, under the table for five, 10 years, save some money. Family was back home in Mexico. And then they would go back and they'd use the money they saved to buy a pickup truck or buy a plot of land. And then maybe after a while, the, they'd come back with the oldest son and do the same thing. As it becomes more difficult to enter the US, what you see is the male head of, head of household comes to the US and says, you know, that was tough. I, I'm not coming back. And then they miss their wife and their kids, and so they say, hey, why don't you guys come and join us, join me in the US. And so then the wife and kids come to the US. And so what you get, instead of this migration pattern of temporary undocumented status and they go back, what you get is they come and they stay. And that's really what causes the undocumented population in the US to start swelling and getting bigger, is because they're not leaving. So the, the harder, tougher enforcement is actually making the system worse. Question about the H-1 visa requested by employers. Does it fit under the quotas described? Uh, no, those are temporary visas. Um, the people who are allowed to come for a short period of time, work legally and leave. Um, and those are sort of unskilled. And so the real question is, how do we deal with this? Do we? continue letting in people temporarily, or do we actually create a more permanent, long-term, unskilled labor? Um, and then you're starting to get into the real nuts and bolts of labor policy under the immigration law, and I think I would lose all of you. How many unskilled workers enter illegally per year? How does the law need to be changed to make them legal, since we depend on these people in our economy? Well, one solution would be paths to legalization for people who are already here, right? So the, the number of undocumented people, I think it's around 12 million in this country, would have some way to adjust their status. Right now, you can't. As Ed pointed out, DACA is the only thing that allows you to go from undocumented to sort of legitimate and have some rights, right? Even in-state tuition, back when we had it in Wisconsin, just said undocumented students could pay in state. As a Jewish Muslim, I used to think about my undocumented students driving to campus and be like, oh my god, you could easily get deported. So paths to legalization for people who are already here. Right now, it's, it's, it's very costly and punitive. You have to go back to the country you came from and apply, and it takes you know, the line that Ed talked about. That would be one really important thing. In 1986, with the Immigration Reform and Control Act, there was an amnesty. That's another way we could go. Now, one really interesting thing for me as a cultural historian is since 1986, amnesty has become a dirty word on the right. Amnesty is a lovely word. It's from the Bible. It's like forgiveness. It's, it's actually a commandment, right? But now it's like, oh, amnesty. But it's a nice thought. Like somebody came here, and you're looking at the great-grandchild -grand of an undocumented migrant who came before it was illegal. That's how my family got here. That's how. Um, and these will be final questions, one's for Ed and one's for Rachel. Uh, Ed, what is the status of recognizing refugee status due to the consequences of climate change? Uh, well, it, it, um, that's, a, that's one of these fun law school questions for an exam. Uh, what happens if you live on an island in the middle of the Pacific and due to climate change your island is disappearing, so you have no choice but to leave, but no other country wants to take you, so they come to the U.S. and say, hey, I'm a climate change refugee, give me political asylum. Um, well, again, political asylum provides a way for you to stay in the United States under the law, but you have to demonstrate a well-founded fear of persecution, which is defined as intentionally inflicted harm against you, for five reasons. Because of your race, your religion, your nationality, your political opinion, or you belong to a particular social group that's been stigmatized. Um, 
having your island disappear in the ocean does not fall in those categories. Nor does fleeing from a civil war, like in Yemen, where they're just randomly destroying whole cities and towns, nor does fleeing from a natural disaster where a flood has, or an earthquake has wiped out any means of, of surviving. So part, and this might be you know, immigration reform 2.0, but part of this has to be a look at our definition of a refugee under the law, who's entitled, is it too narrow? Are there groups of people who are displaced from their home that maybe should be included in the definition. Um, and right now, climate change is, is not, and there are many other people who are displaced from their homes who do not qualify. And Rachel, can you elaborate on the mechanism that generate profit for private prisons? Um, I just want to add something to Ed's response to the climate change thing, and then I will. It's really important that many of the migrants in the caravan are of indigenous descent and that the murder rate in Honduras for environmental activists is very, very high. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, the Lenca people from whom Berta Cáceres was a, sort of the most internationally known advocate, she was murdered in 2016 for advocating that an international, for protesting an international mining corporation that wanted to build a dam on a river sacred to the Lenca people. Right? So the people who will be dispossessed by that land are climate refugees, right? And fleeing, hun so like we, we have streams of climate refugees who are not called that. We don't recognize, I think, very enough the extent to which um, Guada you know, Central Americans are indigenous migrants who are fleeing not only economic and political, but also climate devastation. Um, the mechanism, I think, is pretty simple about private prisons. You have these very powerful international corporations, Geo Group is one, Core Civic is another, there's others, G4S. They're involved with what you could call the global security business. They build um, walls, they build fences, they build the apartheid wall in Israel-Palestine, they maintain partition fences, they provide policing to cities. You know, if, if we start thinking about um, the, the school to prison pipeline, you know, it's, it's part of that. Those are very powerful economic interests and they lobby on both sides. So I think to add to, to Ed's answer about why Obama deported a lot of people, it's really important to see that, you know, you have bipartisan, you have like Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump. The detention industrial complex is just being built and built and built, right? That, that the song remains the same because the, I, the INS, now DHS, that's a really powerful governmental entity. There's a powerful private lobby, and there's a lot of money in private prisons. I mean, a friend of mine does work in a private detention facility south of Austin where she was teaching. She said, you know, the thing about going there, and she was going there to visit people and do advocacy, but it was the nicest building in a small town that had been devastated for 70 years, that had lost its industry, right? So in the small town, People love their detention facility. It was the only jobs in town. They would have swap meets on Saturdays in the parking lot at the detention. It was the only nice building. She was like, it was much nicer than the public schools, right? Because these folks have a lot of money. Like money is being sucked from public education and put into detention. Like they have the buildings we're supposed to have. The, it, the government pays per day per detained person a certain amount of money. So the more people detained, the more money goes to the company. There's a lot of information. Um, there, there, people want to know what they can do when they go to a forum like this, too. You don't want to just do nothing. So there's information uh, about organizations, some of whom are represented here today, and information um, outside, too, that has um, action activities. Uh, we also, first of all, thank you so much. We really learned so much from each of you. It was great. Thank you. And there's, there's more to come for those of you who'd like to stay. We would also want to let you know that somebody will collect your evaluations at the door. It's nice if you could do an evaluation when you leave the auditorium. Um, are you good? Eloisa? Okay. Do you want to say? Finished? I'm finished. Um, be before you leave, I just want to encourage you that you can use this evaluation form to also put your name and uh, email address on here if you would like any follow-up information. The League will 
uh, begin to um, take a role in some of the actions that will be forthcoming as it relates to DACA and uh, the driver's license matter. So um, add your information here. I would like to be sure to thank Kathleen Dunn for her wonderful role as moderator. I told her at the beginning, I said we felt like we were in such great hands with Kathleen uh, providing us this uh, role in moderation of the, of the question and answer period and the panel portion. I would like to uh, once again thank our panelists for being here today. I would like to thank you for being here today. So please, can I give yourselves a round of applause? And you know, please, um, you know, the idea here is with our league is to be informed as best as possible. It's complicated. There's contradictory information. But um, and feel free to visit our league website for additional information and other websites that you feel are uh, attempting to provide objective information. Is there any last thing, Mary? I'm sorry, there is one last thing that we ha are asking of our panelists before we wrap up, and that is we've asked them in advance to just share with us one action they think we can take um, as a result of the information we learned here today. So I'm going to turn back to our panelists and just say they, there is like one sentence or two sentences that they'll share with us in terms of specific ideas that we can consider as we move forward. I would start with Rachel. Um, so the representatives from VOSAs have a petition to sign for Governor Evers supporting driver's licenses for undocumented folks in Wisconsin. There's also a lobby day on the 14th. Is there anything I'm missing? This are gonna, oh yeah, oh May Day. You can come to May Day, which is an amazing, beautiful day and there's usually really great popsicle vendors at the end of it. So come to May Day, march with us. Um, um, it starts at VOSAs, which is 1027 South 5th Street in the 5th Ward. And um, you know, if you park anywhere near there, you'll see just a huge mass of people. And it's, um, do we know what the route is this year? It's going to be in Madison. Oh, it's going to be in Madison. Sorry, I forget what I said. So the the whole May Day is in Madison this year. Okay, it's going to be in Madison. And where do people meet? Okay, and if people want to meet you there, it's at the Capitol. Okay, Capitol May first. What time? Mm -hmm. Like 9 a.m. Capital. This is May 1st, not the 14th. Okay, wow. I'm glad I glad we discussed this. Uh, my action item is my action item is that in the House of Representatives, a bill has just been introduced, which is a standalone DACA bill, which would make as a matter of law the protections for the Dreamers, and it would no longer be tied to presidential. Um, tolerance, um, and it's not, it's not connected to anything else. So it's not connected to wall funding, it's not connected to reforming other immigration provisions, because once you start connecting other things, everything falls apart. So if you're in support of it, call your representatives in the House, whether that's Sensenbrenner or Gwen Moore or whoever beat Randy Bryce. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was going to say additionally, uh, adding to what Rachel said, um, also call you know, your representatives and show your support for um, licenses and in-state tuition for Wisconsin uh, residents. Um, just call them and the numbers will you know, do something. Thank you. As we uh, wrap up, I just want to again acknowledge our elected officials in the audience, Alderman Borkowski and Judge Hannah Dugan, for being with us this entire time. But now we do have, I'm really hoping that all of you take the opportunity to join us in our small group, smaller group discussion. And we do have people posted outside of the room uh, to show you where uh, to direct you to the places. But there is some munchies out in the back as well. So stop, grab some munchies, and then please proceed to the uh, smaller rooms. Thank you once again. Should we push this up and do it around this or is this? No. Because